The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. In addition to being the, the chair of 327, I was actually the chair of the Pavements Committee 325 when we took the subcommittee and broke it out and petitioned TAC to make it a committee, 327, because of the, 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 the important differences between roller compacted and conventional concrete pavements. And we now have our, our first document because a previous document was a committee 325 document. So here's the cover. I, I know you all have purchased it already, but anyway, to remind you, this is what it looks like. And I think we were probably the very last published document of the entire year to get the Dash 14. We came in very late, but we're still a Dash 14 document. And this is what's covered. There's a normal introduction, your normal chapter two notation and definitions will go through that and then the various chapters that we developed in a, a kind of important appendix that walks you through mixture proportioning um, based on the soil compaction method. Now, a lot of this material actually came from a previous effort published in 2010 by the Concrete Pavement Tech Center, a guide for roller compacted concrete pavements uh, in cooperation with the Portland Cement Association and many of the 327 members were also part of the committee developing that, and they borrowed a lot from ACI documents, so it's um, a partnership. Um, and the previous document we had was a 32510R state of the art report on roller compacted concrete pavements, published by 325 in 1995, 20 years ago. And when we went to reauthorize the pavement, tax, the, the document tax said, you can't have something that's 15 years old and call it a state-of-the-art report. So we removed the word state-of-the-art report and we republished it anyway. So, but the, the parallel we did with this is for the 325.13 overlays document, the base document for that was actually developed under an FHWA contract. And we did a lot of work in the meantime. I mean, it has taken 10 years to make the translation. So overall, an in introduction and definitions slide I stole years ago from the Portland Cement Association, what is RCC, either Jan or somebody else. Roller compacted concrete and no slump concrete that's compacted by vibratory rollers, although our terminology starts to get us in trouble because we do have some where there aren't rollers because the paver itself provides sufficient compaction. But um, it's a zero slump concrete and a lot of the elements that are involved in ordinary concrete pavement construction the forms reinforcing steel, the finishing aren't there, so there's economics, but it is, it is a type of uh, concrete. Um, this is a photograph. The previous photograph was, uh, I think that was like a subdivision project in Columbus, Ohio, so there's a lot of different applications. So that's the placement. Um, the interesting thing about the entire thing is if you other than the material, it tends to look very much like an asphalt paving operation, either conventional or um, uh, heavy duty uh, at, uh, paver delivered in um, dump trucks, except that it's not hot, things like that, and then, and then rolled typically with rollers. And uh, some of the artwork, again, that was developed um, by the, uh, the CP Tick Center was, was comparisons between conventional concrete pavement and asphalt pavements, what the shared material characteristics and the, uh, the processing and, and so forth. Um, so that brings us into some of the key elements and I've, I've got a lot of material uh, and I'll skip over some of it because everything is pretty much in the report. The engineering properties of RCC are typically equal to a superior to conventional concrete Compressive strengths can be rather high. Flexural strengths are often uh, rather high. Um, similar modulus elasticity. In terms of the mixtures, 
is you typically looking at the balance between the conventional concrete and the reinforced uh, concrete, you um, have a, uh, a little less cement, a lot less water, and a change in the ratio, of course, to fine aggregate. Um, and there are also a lot of other, other basic differences, both between the mixture proportions, the workability, which is essentially zero slump, or you could even say negative slump, because you really have to add water to get it even to zero slump, and then the way that the material is placed and, and consolidated. And an important characteristic that we like to take advantage of is the fact that you can uh, get on it for further construction operations a lot earlier. The fact that it, uh, as compared to Portland cement concrete, conventional concrete, which is the um, uh, which is the uh, lighter line, you get you get strength and stiffness much earlier, and so that can can work. Um, towards a large project. So there are a lot of benefits of the material. There are also some limitations of the material, and we just do discuss those in the guide. You can generally place it very quickly with uh, minimal labor, and it does have high load carrying ability in the ultimate state, but it also does allow for some degree of load carrying capability even, even uh, after it's placed down very quickly. Gain strength very quickly in a very highly durable material. Um, there have been a lot of surveys done of existing roller compacted concrete pavements that have held up in some very harsh climates. Um, low maintenance is often cited. I don't think, I'm going to look at these slides. Um, I don't actually, in, in many of these presentations, we've shown a picture of the, uh, the Saturn automobile plant. It was an early user of wide-scale roller compacted concrete for the Saturn facility. The roller compacted concrete actually lasted longer than Saturn as an auto company. So very durable material. <laughs> like other um, concrete pavements, the light surface reduces lighting requirements, although there's a little bit of a caveat be with that because I think it tends to be a little darker with a rougher texture than conventional concrete. At some point, it starts to look like very, very bad, badly faded, as faded asphalt, so not as much of a uh, reflective benefit, and on the whole, very, very economical. Um, common uses typically seem to be things like uh, uh, a lot of the traditional uses have been ports, intermodal facilities, and heavy industrial areas. A very economical way of doing acres of um, heavy-duty pavement re relatively quickly. But there has been some branching out into other areas, lighter industrial areas, uh, in some cases airport service areas, a uh, fair amount of use for arterial streets and local streets, some of that in Columbus, Ohio, widening and shoulder applications, starting to look at multi-layer pavement systems for high-speed uses. And then actually this is at the end, but traditionally a lot of the uses are logging facilities, composting areas, um, and, and storage yards. So uh, one of the examples, um, a lot of the southern uh, auto plants, and I think this is one of the ones years ago that uh, Ferris and I were working on some research at, the Honda plant in Alabama, as I said, RCC for the Saturn plant in Tennessee and the Mercedes plant in, uh, in Alabama. So a lot of use for these. Uh, and, and really, I think the, um, the Honda and Mercedes plants were looking at the Saturn performance and the fact that it, they'd essentially had no maintenance as a standpoint. An example of a large port facility, Port of Norfolk in Virginia. Uh, we, we provide some examples, as I'll mention later, as we look at enhancing the document going forward, we thought that we might want to add an appendix of project profiles or some things like that to add that on. So even though we um, have completed the document, our first order of business is, okay, now we've got a usable document. How do we make it better? How do we make it for the, and part of that could be with a few more detailed project profiles. Uh, one of the interesting things of the material is as long as you have the second paving train within about an hour, works very well for two-lift construction to the point where 
you can pull out a core and, is, and you can have a very, very difficult time telling which is the bottom lift and which is the top lift because they're so well bonded. Uh, it also offers the opportunity to do two lift construction with various types of concrete in between, but of course it's easier to build with only a, uh, a, single, a single type of concrete. Intermodal facilities, uh, Detroit, Denver, some of these really go back uh, quite a ways. Um, port terminals as part of the intermodal facilities, various ports. Uh, distribution centers, there's an example of an 18 acre distribution center in Austin, I think maybe the, one of the older, older ones showing 10 years after construction. Some of these, uh, actually this one section of the presentation, a lot of these photos are not in the ACI document, I have them from other sources. Um, warehouse facilities, even including some interior warehouses. One of the first projects I saw in Birmingham, Alabama was um, a block factory being put in with roller compacted concrete for the pavement. When you're stacking up pallets and pallets of concrete block, it, 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 it provides an excellent service for that. Uh, that may be that project on the left, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure, but a lot, of, a lot of industrial applications, of course, uh, Corps of Engineers and mil military facilities going back, going back many years. Um, tank hard stands in, in Fort Carson, Colorado. And uh, a use early on of streets and interchanges and uh, some continuing use even in, o in, even in Ohio for those. And then a widely publicized project, the I-285 uh, shoulder project around Atlanta, Georgia. So those, just some examples. And any areas where you need large areas of heavy duty pavement for composting materials, sludge drying, other industrial applications, we don't want the pavement to break down. So some of the examples of city streets and subdivisions, a lot in Quebec, a lot in Columbus, Ohio. This is uh, some projects me and my grad students were out. I'm sadly to say that's been about 10 years now. Usually covered with a thin asphalt overlay, um, two inches, although they could probably use less. And one major example, Lane Avenue right through the middle of Ohio State University, right by their, uh, their big football stadium. Um, and then one, one of the, uh, one lagging use of this has actually been with state DOTs. They've tended to adopt it somewhat slowly. Um, US 78 near Charleston, 10 inches of RCC with two inches of asphalt on top. So the document provides some guidance on properties and materials. Uh, the materials to, for when the RCC is left as a final surface texture, we generally have gone with smaller coarse aggregate sizes for better surface texture, 5 eighths, 3 quarter of an inch. Uh, a uh, little bit less coarse aggregate, a little bit more fine aggregate. Some projects, like the Honda project, we had a combined gradation that was supplied by an aggregate manufacturer. Can use all kind of cementitious materials, cement, fly ash, uh, slag cement, silica fume common in Quebec. To date, there has not been a whole lot of use of chemical admixtures fiber, some of those other things, I think they might provide opportunities to enhance RCC, but there hasn't been a lot of research. I mentioned earlier that state DOTs have tended not to look in it very deeply, and in many states, that's who funds the materials research. So as a result, the research base in roller compacted concrete, the way I figure it, is about one PhD every 10 years. David, I think, was the first one. But yeah, that's what it's averaged over 30 years. So now there's three. Um, we look at your combined aggregate gradation, and really it's very close to try to develop an asphalt type gradation and minimize uh, the use of pace. So again, these are some of the charts uh, developed. Uh, the factors by uh, Harrington and his colleagues, factors considering proportioning, the constructability, the mechanical strength, the economy, and the durability and performance all that play in. There's a number of mixture proportioning methods and probably the most widely one that I've seen used is a soil compaction method. That's the most common for pavements and uh, that's the one that Appendix A of this document covers in detail. 
other ones like the concrete, consistency method, solid suspension method, optimal pace volume method, seem to be most commonly used for hydraulic structures, by which I mean dams. It's, um, back when we looked at the formation of 327, we talked about should there just be a roller compacted committee that looked at both pavements and dams. And the more you look at it, there are so many differences between materials and techniques with pavements and dams that it didn't make a whole lot of sense. Soil compaction method is you start out building a well-graded aggregate skeleton, kind of way, the way you would uh, design hot mix asphalt. Um, selecting a mid-range cementitious content and then developing a moisture density relationship the same as you would in soil compaction. And then you cast samples to measure the compressive strength, test the specimens, decide from them which cementitious content you're going to use and calculate your mixture proportions. So uh, you try to get as close as possible to your 0.45 aggregate curve, but it's, you can be a little bit forgiving about it. Uh, typically you will add cementitious materials would be about 11 to 13 percent. Um, you look at your moisture density curve because you're, uh, you're not adding water for slump, you're really adding water on the basis of coming up with your optimum moisture content, and so a standard uh, Proctor curve, getting your maximum dry density. The uh, cylinders are typically made uh, with a vibrating, vibrating hammer um, with the ASTM C1435 in the laboratory. In the field, things get even more interesting. And so an example that's given in Appendix A is if we have a parking lot, we want a 4,000 PSI compressive strength with a safety margin of 5,000 PSI. Basically, Appendix A walks you through your materials, uh, developing your blend, which would be in this case 55% coarse, 45% fine. We try a cement content of 12%. We look at those. Um, once we find the optimum moisture content, we might look at 10, 12, and 14 percent, plot those, and that would tell us that we should use 12.7 cement by plotting the strength versus cementitious, the uh, content of cement that brings us to the 5,000 PSI is a 12.7. Um, in terms of structural design, it's very much the same, well, we don't know enough to not design it other than conventional concrete pavements, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, it's designed as plain, reinforced, undoweled, uh, thickness range it, for one lift is in the 4 to 10 inch range. If you want to go thicker, you can. That's multiple lift. As with any design procedure, it's going to depend on your expected loads, the concrete strength, and the soil characteristics. There are a lot of procedures, some for single vehicles, if you really have one heavy vehicle that's going to dominate the design of your pavement like a container hauler or a tank, then the Portland Cement Association, the Army Corps of Engineers have developed procedures for more conventional pavements. We adopted the tables from ACI 330 and ACI 325-12R, which are the do that's a document for streets and local roads, based on things like the stress ratio, fatigue of roller compacted concrete, there has been some work done on fatigue of roller compacted concrete and some of the uh, accelerated loading tests done down at uh, Baton Rouge suggest maybe we might want to look at that a little further. Um, the sub-base, sub-grade, sub-base base design from a structural standpoint are the same as for conventional concrete pavements except that you have to have sufficient stiffness of the base to be able to compact the RCC. So that ends up being a key element. So. The document goes through design examples where you've got a straddle carrier, one very heavy vehicle, an industrial facility, and going through those, if you have 30 a day, about 220,000 over 20 years, is a 120,000 pound vehicle. You go through the charts, you would come up with a design thickness of 11 and a half inches using either the Portland Cement Association method or design software, and we replicate the charts in those. <coughs> A lot of this stuff, incidentally, was back in the 325-10R um, 1995 document, looking at dual-wheel straddle carriers and other examples. In this case, um, 
a 60,000 pound vehicle, and as a result, this worked out to be a, um, I think a 15, you can get away with about a 15 inch thickness going through that example. Corps of Engineers um, is, is laid out in those procedures. If you have hard questions about that, Dave's right over there for later on. Uh, an example would be an 80,000 pound track vehicle with 30 a day and through the core procedure then a eight and a half inch RCC pavement would be able to handle that. And that's the same procedure that's used for conventional concrete as far as I know. So um, for parking lots, streets, and local roads, we just replicated the tables um, from ACI 330 and uh, 325. So that production, uh, there's a lot of notes on production in terms of mixing cases where we're putting it in a transit mixer and then putting it in a truck. I think that's widely done in Chattanooga, different types of mixing plants. Um, construction process, fairly simple. It works best for wide open unimpeded placement runs. You have to be concerned about blocking out fixtures and uh, moisture control. Uh, photo of subgrade preparation, loading the material uniformly in the dump truck to prevent segregation placing and the timing of sequences usually you want within 60 minutes to prevent bond I mean, took to, to promote bond and keeping continuous movement so we look at both uh, construction with conventional asphalt pavers aggregate spreaders the high density pavers and the rolling process and we spend a lot of time and we did back in the 32510R on the joints because the joints are where these things tend to perform badly if so making sure that you have properly constructed joints so fresh joints cold joints and horizontal joints we have uh, those charts go back to the 95 document but with some better illustrations in the saw joints and it's very important if you have anything in the pavement that you have proper isolation because we found that without proper isolation joints the RCC can push and damage those embedded fixtures and that's what it looks like when it does. So that picture's in the guide as well. Curing's extremely important, generally with the curing compounds. I think I'm about out of my time, but I want to talk about where we're going to go from here. Right now, um, I have on the agenda for Tuesday's meeting a uh, quick touchdown happy dance for getting the uh, document out. And then we need to look at what else we need to bring in. Is there information? from the, the old state-of-the-art report like in historical development that didn't make it in. We actually found that there's a document called ACI 3095R, Compaction and Roller Compacted Concrete. It kind of flips back and forth between pavements and dams, but we need to take a good hard look at that and see what information from that needs to come in this document, what other improvements, and whether or not we as a committee need to develop a specification for RCC pavements. And I know ACPA is working on that, and we really hope they did a good job because writing a specification is a big pain. Do um, we have time for questions, or did I yes, it all Yes, we do have a little time for questions, so uh, thank you, Norb. But uh, does anyone have any questions uh, for Norb regarding uh, the, this document or the development of it? It's great. Yes, Buy it. Yeah. What's the difference between freeze for uh, resistance of uh, conventional and RCC? Oh, how much time? Yet? In, in the performance, the freeze thaw performance in harsh environments has shown that dense, properly compacted RCC, even though it's very, very hard to entrain a proper air void system, it holds up very well. One of the reasons in uh, Quebec that they make a lot of use of silica fume is they found in their environment that the silica fume gives them good freeze thaw durability and uh, and and good scaling resistance. And I would say that. Uh, the, looking at the core installations over the years in places like Fort Drum, New York, and Watertown in some very harsh environments, it holds up. Now you take the stuff and you put it through ASTM C666, it doesn't look all that good. But in the field and actual practice, it's tended to hold up very well. Is that pretty much, yeah? Excellent question. I didn't hit on that. Uh, traditionally, we used to just let it crack wherever. Um, now we're starting to see more and more wanting to saw joints in, and those probably tend to be on about a 30-foot or 10-meter interval apart, saw, saw cuts. And so I think I had a slide that did show 
those patterns in, and we found that if you do that, you, you can put them further apart than conventional concrete because I don't think you have quite as much shrinking and warping because of the lower amount of water. But even though for a long time I think we said you don't need them and just let it crack, I think we've kind of gone to, yeah, it's probably going to work a whole lot better if you saw some joints in. One last question, if anyone has it. Yes. Sawing joints, partial depth or full depth? Those would all be partial depth, maybe quarter, third thickness. So you have the aggregate interlock to, uh, to try to keep them from faulting. Norm, thank you very much.